Okay, I'm going to be quite brief because I know this is sort of heavy going stuff and having to listen to bits about the law. But the interesting thing is, and the one thing I like about the whole review of the Animal Welfare Act, that we've seen a little bit of honesty coming out of uh, NPI as it is called now. Uh, as Vernon already mentioned, they want to now put transition or um, and economic uh, realities and feasibilities as a primary consideration. That's, I suppose, honest from their point of view. But in this paper which they brought out, so Animal Welfare Matters, this was the, the, the document that they put out in, uh, where they suggested all the things that they were going to be putting in. They were actually even more honest in there. Because I'll read, I'll read this line out to you. They say, this strategy is not aiming to lift animal welfare standards from their current settings. <laughs> That's very honest, isn't it? Yeah. But you think, well, what the bloody hell are you then doing? What, what a waste of time. Um, so, but that's, so they put it in there. So I asked about that straight away. So why why do you put it in there? Why don't you take an opportunity when you review legislation to make it better? <laughs> no, no, that was not the idea. Uh, and in fact, as Vernon has pointed out, they could make it very well much worse. And, and one of the things to to add to um, what Vernon talked about, uh, when he a lot of uh, talk was about Section 73, with those exceptional circumstances that will allow practices to continue that are actually should be illegal because they breach the legislation. Well what they're now actually proposing is one of those lines is going to be worse now. So they are going to keep in this situation where if there is a transition, so if they find one practice is breaking the law and therefore it has to be phased out, so they're going to allow for that in a transition phase. So that's what we currently already have and they're going to allow for that. But they're going to add another clause to that. They're now also going to say we're also going to allow a practice that doesn't meet the obligation of the Act to continue indefinitely. So that word indefinitely was not there before. But that's huge. And they, and they say, well, but that's for things like, like religious slaughter. Because as you may know that uh, the Jewish community, they do kosher slaughter. And then they're fighting very hard to maintain that right to do that. And kosher slaughter is killing animals without um, uh, stunning. And, and they say, well, that's, that's for that. But the moment NAWEC puts in that they can allow practices to continue indefinitely, guess what it's going to be for? It's going to be for meat chickens. It's going to be for battery hens. It's going to be for pigs in crates. That's what they're actually going to be using it for. So you're going to have a situation where millions of animals are going to be kept in conditions that are acknowledged to be breaking the law, but they still can carry on with it. And that's what's happening at the moment. And I think that's a really big problem, and that's what we will be addressing. Um, and what we already have addressed in a 68-page submission, which is bloody tough to read, but very important. So, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, for like 25 years, and unfortunately I've become quite negative about how our legislators deal with animal welfare in New Zealand. Effectively, they're there to make money out of animals, as Vernon pointed out, $21 billion we make out of animals, and we spend 0.03%, I think it is, on, back on their welfare. Which is absolutely nothing, of course. And so what SAFE believes is that as long as we have that attitude that we are not going to properly fund it, we are not going to see any real change. Because how can you, it doesn't matter what you write in the law, if you can't enforce it because you don't have the inspectors. Like in New Zealand we have 11 uh, MPI inspectors that have to look after the welfare of over a hundred million animals. How do you do that? I, I, I wouldn't know even how you can do that. So these people actually only go out when there are serious complaints and then they usually try to educate the farmer. It doesn't really matter how cruel it is almost, but they will educate the farmer to do better. So only if, if there is willful cruelty to the animals, so, so if somebody has to really set out to be deliberately cruel, then maybe they will take action. Or if the cases are massive, like hundreds and hundreds of animals dying of starvation, maybe they will take action. And even then, when they take action, the fines, for instance, and the result can be appalling. <coughs> so even in New Zealand, we've had farmers that have neglected animals by the hundreds so that they died in their paddocks, around their houses. The farmers saw them lying dead. They did nothing. Well, they were prosecuted, they get a fine, but they can still keep on farming. Well, should people like that be allowed to farm? <coughs> I don't think so. so, so there is a real problem with regards to the enforcement side of it, because people are simply underfunded, they haven't got the resources, we've got too few people that can enforce, 
and then the fact is that they have to try to prosecute somebody based on a, on a piece of legislation which doesn't actually back them up. There's too many loopholes, it's too difficult. So what SAVE wants to do with regards to the Animal Welfare Act, we, we have a few areas um, that we want to focus on. Um, the first one is, is obviously that Section 73. We, we want that word indefinite removed, because if that gets in, well, you can well forget about it, really. And we are also very concerned ab about uh, the fact that economic considerations become primary considerations. Because at the moment, they would only really have to look at the eco economic situations, as Sverna said, if they're looking at transition, if they're looking at phasing out a practice. So, for instance, with the battery hand cages, they found that battery hand cages don't meet the requirements of the law. Then you have to look at the economics when you phase them out. And we think that's actually quite reasonable, provided you, you know, you be reasonable about it and do that in, within a normal period of time, not a hundred years, for instance. Um, as you probably know at the moment, um, that uh, the National Animal Welfare Advisory Committee um, took three years to rewrite the layer hand code. When they wrote the code in 2005, they said, well, we don't feel really, really good about this code because we think that battery hand cages probably do break the law. So, but we, we're going to allow them to continue, but we'll look at them again in about 2009 and then we'll decide what we're going to do with these cages. That's what they said. Well, that code, that review, didn't come out until 2012. So it took them three years to write a code. And they said, okay, well, battery hand cages clearly break the law because animals can't express their behavior. So we're going to phase them out through a transitional phase out, different dates for different age cages. And the end phase out date is going to be 2022. That's when the standard battery hand cages uh, must be gone. But we are going to put new cages in them. And we call them colony cages. And we say that they are wonderful. And then they do meet the obligations of the egg. So three years to decide that. But now, the industry was complaining to them. They say, oh, it's too fast. Yeah. And don't forget, now, those cages on principle should have been illegal since the year 2000. When the Animal Welfare Act said, animals must be able to express their normal behavior. So in fact, the industry had 22 years to get rid of a practice that breaches the legislation. So now the farmer says, no, no, it's too quick, it's too quick. So NABEC now, after three years of work, have said, oh, sorry. And now they have commissioned a company in, in Christchurch to look at those transitional phase out dates to say, well, oh, sorry, maybe they are too quick. And so what's going to happen now, I can guarantee it, that all the farmers are sitting on very old cages, even cages that are illegal, because they were, were supposed to have been phased out by 2008, I can guarantee you they will get a longer time to get rid of those cages. So after three years of work for Neyway, they still couldn't get it right. They still obviously didn't do the research of whether that was too fast or not. Because now the, now the industry is complaining, they're falling over straight away again. And that shows you that Neyway is easily pushed, out, pushed over by industry interest. They've always done that. For instance, they, want, they were thinking about, oh, let's go ban tail docking of dogs because we only do it because we like the look of it, no other reason. So clearly that should be an easy thing. The moment the dog breeders stood up and said, no, 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 because we like the look of it, and then it was like, oh, sorry. Carry on, please. And, and that's the weakness of this committee. They are seriously weak. Because I think, for instance, we have a good case to kind of go running up to Navy and say, but you are allowing colony cages for battery hands to be introduced. But they are just another battery cage. You know, I, I've been in that system, I've seen the cages, and they are just another battery cage. So, should we now go and say to Navy, you need to get animal behaviorists in, because we believe that they do not meet the obligations of the act because the animals still can't express their normal behavior. But they won't listen to us. They won't do that. And we can bring in dozens of animal behaviorists that will say that colony cages still do not allow the hens to express their normal behavior. I think that's a really big important point because that's going to be the future of the industry. But they don't want to listen to us. But the industry says, oh, you know, those next four years, I want my old cages that I already had for 34 years or so for another five years. They say, oh yeah, okay, of course. So you just can see where that, that NAWIC sits with regards to, you know, looking after animals, nah, looking after the industry, oh yes. And that's what they are about. Anyway, so SAVE will be focusing on Section 73. A lot, we want that word indefinite out, and we don't want the, the economics to become a primary consideration. Um, another thing, and for the mix it, hunting is really important that we focus on. Because it's ridiculous 
to have a situation where thousands and thousands of animals are being slaughtered every year and there's there are no rules around it. You can do however whatever you like. So we want that addressed. Um, another thing which is really important, and, and these are sort of more smaller things, but the reason why we're focusing on them, because we think that they will probably realize that they have to throw us a bone. You know? So we're probably going to get something happening. So for instance, we think we will achieve, maybe through this act, that we could see a ban to keeping uh, exotic animals in circuses. So, so that's an easy thing to ask for, because at the moment, we don't have any exotic animals in circuses. <laughs> so they're probably saying, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, it's easy for them to do. But the reason why we're asking for it is important, because then we become part of an international scene of, of countries banning the use of exotic animals in circuses, and it will help other groups overseas that are fighting for that. So it is important that we do that. But it's also important, because otherwise you have some joker next year showing up and saying, oh yeah, I'm starting up a circus and I want a couple of tigers and a couple of whatever, elephants. And there's no law that would stop that. So it would be good if we could get something like that in law. The same as keeping um, dolphins, you know, like marine men, keeping dolphins in captivity. We think there's a chance that we can get that stopped, because we don't do it at the moment. <laughs> so, so unfortunately, we're just asking for really easy stuff. And we, we try to get some, some, some traction on that. Um, another really important one in the legislation that we really want to address is the uh, live export for slaughter. So we want the government to use this opportunity of the Animal Welfare Act review to say absolutely never will New Zealand be sending animals overseas for slaughter. So that at the moment we are sending animals overseas for, for breeding purposes. And there are some real issues with that, and there are real problems with that. But it's nowhere near as bad as it was, as it was in the past, when we would send millions of animals away to be slaughtered in the Middle East. But at the moment, whilst it is not easy for a company to do that, on principle they can still do it in New Zealand. So they have to meet certain standards and regulations, but they can't possibly do it. And we believe that this is a good opportunity for the government to say, no, it can't happen. Because it will Hell will break out, I can tell you, if that would happen in New Zealand. It will be the first time that I will be arrested. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, 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 so there are a number of key things that we want to focus on. And you can go, you would have found the little cards on your seat. Did we put those little cards on the seat? So if you can go to our, uh, our website, you can see a whole number of issues that SAFE wants to address. And we, we've been calling on people to write submissions. So, so when um, this goes to select committee, when, when the whole bill is being discussed, we do want people to put some pressure on. Because what we do find is that if it just comes from the animal groups and it doesn't come from the public, you know, the politicians go like, oh, it's not an issue, nobody cares about this. Because I bet you that the farmers and, and the animal using industries, they will have their lobbyists out there. You know, they, they have their professional people talking to politicians they will see how important this is for them. So they will be fighting very hard. So if the public doesn't speak out on this, it's simply not going to work for animals. Now, am I positive that this is going to make change for animals through the legislation? No. I don't think we're going to achieve an awful lot with, through the legislation. But I think it's really important that as a community, as, as animal welfare oriented people, that we speak out. Because if we don't speak out, well, we're definitely, we definitely not going to get anything. But also, every time we speak out, other people listen. And other people start to act. So, I've been campaigning against Bethlehem farming for you know, 25 years. We still haven't got legislation that will actually get rid of cages. But every time we talk about it, there will be people that's out there that stop buying battery eggs. And that directly helps the animals. Because if people stop buying it, obviously farmers will stop producing it. And yes, some people will buy free range, and there's issues with that. But the fact is that at the moment we have about 400,000 chickens in New Zealand that don't have to live in battery hen cages. That if we hadn't spoken out, they'd still be in those cages. And that's a lot of animals that we're helping. So you've got to really look at it like that. Every single animal that you can help through speaking out or doing something is important. If you find an injured animal on the road, and you take it home and you look after it and you let it go again, you feel mighty good about yourself, don't you? Well, we are doing that all the time for thousands of animals, but we just don't get to see them. So I think that's why it's important that we need to speak out. And I think also our voice is growing. You know, as an organization over the years, SAFE has grown enormously. 
And it's only because people are finding out what's happening and they are supporting it, supporting us and they want to see change. So that's why it's so important for all of you to get involved with a process like this, you know, to talk to your local port, to your local MP or to write a submission and just get behind it because you know, if we don't do it, well who is going to do it? Elliot, do you have anything to add? Elliot is our campaign director. Uh, no, I was just going to talk about the card and just to say, actually... Just, just come up front, so... Hi. Uh, this is our attempt to make animal welfare law sexy. Uh, so if you go on, you can get a summary of some of the issues that Hans is covering. Uh, also, it's a chance to email your MP directly. And it's really important, short term, long term, actually to keep raising in what welfare issues, as Hans is saying. Um, and also what we see the opportunity as being is the uh, select committee process when Animal Welfare Act is being reviewed. So actually this is a point when we can actually put some pressure on MPs, political parties. If you belong to a political party, it's actually a really useful thing to raise it within your networks as well. Um, Fern, and, and, and uh, we've, we've talked about the economic impact. And one of the key things why we still have better hand farming in New Zealand is that the government has bought the argument from the industry that if they have to get rid of their cages, that poor people can't afford to buy eggs anymore. <laughs> and then, so, uh, and I've had meetings with the industry, and, and they, they're saying that they, they are, they're pretending that they are doing the world a favor by pr producing cheap protein because other little kids will starve otherwise. Seriously, I mean, these people are crazy as, as, <laughs> when they speak to you about it. But the Consumer Institute did actually did, did some research, and they actually found that eggs are about one third of the price that they were in 1960. So in 1960, the equivalent uh, price for a dozen eggs was ten dollars forty, whereas now it's something like less than four dollars. So if effectively, is the birds, the chickens, the hens have been paying the price because of their cruel system. And even a consumer magazine, and this is a magazine that speaks up for consumers, says it's only because of the cruel badger in cages. And they are totally in favor of getting rid of that cruel system. So the fact is that as consumers, the people that buy these cheap eggs, because of that, those hands suffer. And the industry, they don't give a damn about feeding poor people. They just want to make money. But they, they have successfully used that argument in the political world to convince politicians. And I've had meetings in the past with Jim Anderton when he was Minister of Agriculture. I sat in front of him and he was telling me almost verbatim what I had on a piece of paper that came from the industry. So they told him that and he was, it was almost like he was reading it out to me. So clearly it's effective because they have these well-paid lobbyists that can spend time with those people and they buy into it. So this is why it's important that other people speak out to balance that out because they only otherwise hear from the lobbyists, from the industry. Oh, hi, I'm Rosa Mayfield, and I'm the Green Party spokesperson for Animal Welfare. And I fully support, um, thank you both for such a really informative um, presentation and really useful for me. What I just wanted to make a quick comment is, is that democracy is more than your vote. And it is through the select committee processes and other opportunities to engage actively with exercise your democratic rights. And one of your democratic rights is to have your voice heard. And so I really would like to particularly encourage you to not only to put in a submission that can be as simple as you want it to be, and relate it back to what matters to you. The hen pose, the factory hen, your person, both of them that. If it's um, getting rid of um, animals in the still countries, uh, you know, the focus on that. And there is a passionate and um, important freedom. But also ask to be heard. Because the reality is, is that for those of us MPs on the select committee who are listening to the submission, is it the one people who come in and speak to them or phone them and um, make their verbal contribution by phone, is it these submissions that stick in the minds of the politicians? So, um, you know, and I know that this is a really scary thing for the general public because they think, but I'm not an expert. I'll leave it to the expert. 
And what I would like to say is, is that actually you don't need to be a hipster to be able to engage with this. This is your right, and it's your right to come along and say, I care, I want a better outcome for animals, and to just make that point. And I want legislation that will protect animals. And, you know, so make the point that you understand that matter to you, that are relevant to you, but come along and make them and speak from the heart on them. There will be expert submissions by they, by other organisations. And they will bring an expert. But we need the um, backing of the public to be able to say, we want that too. And this matters to us. And animals matter. And we care about animals. So that's really just my heartfelt plea to you. Is exercise your democratic rights. Engage with the system. And as scary as it is, just remember that this is your right. And don't let the select committee process intimidate you. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, you talk about the, the reasonable person in law, uh, have, we, have we painted a picture, uh, you know, in, in terms of the legal system, in terms of uh, politics around it, of what that reasonable person does? Uh, you know, uh, is there some sort of conceptualization of, you know, showing people, well, that the reasonable person you know, tortures animals, the reasonable person uh, locks animals in cages, and is this something that we want to endorse? Uh, well, I think, as I understand your question, um, it's around, is there a standard of, of what is the reasonable person, or the, the reasonable the reasonable man? Um, it's it's um, a thing I, I heard... <laughs> I, I saw a lecture and there was a, there was a guy who wrote a really interesting academic paper about it um, a while ago saying, who is the reasonable man? And went through historical you know, uh, case law. It must have taken years to research and write. But all the instances of what the reasonable man was found to have done in, in, in instances of law. And it was, yeah, they came out looking quite psychotic, really. What, <laughs> what actually, uh, it's, not, it's not a uniform standard. There is no one you know, template. There's certainly not a sort of Aristotelian, you know, virtue ethic that, that is the reasonable person, that's for sure. It's, um, it's, it's all it is, is a standard um, that imports, and an important one that doesn't try to, to lock in, you know, a particular way of acting in a particular situation, you know, that, that allows for evolution over time as social mores change. You know, because it wasn't that long ago that, that you know there were things that were tolerated in society and were considered reasonable. Um, you know that are, that we find abhorrent now. You know um, the way the way women were treated in society a hundred years ago and was considered to be perfectly reasonable. We look back and go, oh, that was appalling. You know, so it's important that you have those sorts of standards in law that do have that sort of flexibility. You know, and do allow um, for evolution. Um, so. I guess, you know, what I, um, yeah, uh, and, and the thing is really too is, is what's interesting in the context of this act is, is looking at, um, the thing I really wanted to draw out is not so much what a standard of reasonableness means, that's what, you know, the proceeding was about, is that that's very flexible and is, is a matter of discretion of whoever the adjudicator is at the time, but to sort of point out that a certain degree of exploitation, pain, suffering is considered to be reasonable and is considered to be necessary as well. You know, reasonableness and, and necessity um, are there and they're just taken for granted, you know, and it's and it's it's more of the law as we have it is about just don't push it too far, don't be don't be a sicko about it, you know. But you're allowed to do quite a lot of horrible stuff legally. Yeah. There's an addition to that as well, which is sort of interesting. When um when NAWAC and the government, when they were trying to formulate the new Animal Welfare Act, this was in the 90s, because we had a piece of legislation which was written mm -hmm. in 1962 called the Animal Protection Act, and that was really outdated, so they were going to do that. And when you saw the first drafts of that act, they actually tried to define what that sort of reasonable was. Mm -hmm. and, and they actually said, what is currently acceptable to society. That's actually what they first came up with, and they had, they had that in there. And that disappeared quite quickly. And the reason why they quite quickly disappeared, because we were like, yoo-hoo, most people are opposed to veterinary farming, for instance. You know, opinion polls show eight out of 10 people are opposed to it. 
So the moment they realized that, that if they were really going to listen to society, New Zealand would, diff would look really different because a lot of people are opposed to a lot of those things. So they decided to take all that away and, and in the end came up with some wishy-washy stuff that a so-called expert panel then has to decide. And the expert panel effectively are obviously uh, industry people or industry related people. So they actually deliberately, well, when, once they found out what they thought was sort of the reasonable thing, uh, they decided, no, no, we can't have reasonable there because that won't work. That's dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Any other thoughts or questions at all? I'll give it a go. Um, so Switzerland gave up the KZX-92. I was wondering, when that happened, there must have been key events in thinking that society led up to that. And if you know what they were, then do you think that can be recreated? I Other countries to do the same. I, I, I know. I have the answer to that. Uh, yeah, in Switzerland, they had a, a citizens-initiated referendum uh, on that issue. And, 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 people in, and in Switzerland, a referendum like that is binding. So in New Zealand, a citizens-initiated referendum is non-binding. But in Switzerland, it is. So people simply voted for it. So, there, so groups brought it forward. I'm not sure if it was the SPCA or other groups, but it was put out as a, a referendum. People said, yep, get rid of the cages. And 10 years, they were gone. So the ref referendum was in 82. And in 92, they got rid of the, uh, the cages. That's how it happened then. Thank you. And th this is one of the reasons why we did in New Zealand, uh, when I, I worked for the SPCA at that time, we also tried to do a citizens initiated referendum, the very first one in New Zealand. And I don't think that the government would have thought that somebody was going to do a referendum about chickens. <laughs> and they didn't like it, because it can cost money to, to, to hold a referendum. So we went out there and we collected 389,000 signatures. It was a huge amount, and a lot of work went into it. But they worked so hard to make sure to, uh, to invalidate most of their signatures because we were the first ones doing it and we needed 240,000 signatures to get a referendum. And in the end, they said out of the 389, only 220,000 were valid, just under the threshold. But what they did is we had whole sheets with 20 signatures, for instance. Somebody would write on the top, good on you, or hello. And they said invalid, the whole sheet was gone. You're surprised, aren't you? It was terrible. And because we left all those sheets out on the street with the body shop, etc., so people scribbled on them and wrote, and they said, no, that could have influenced people. So they did everything in their power to make sure that we were not going to have a referendum on the battery and issue. And we would have won that, because most people would have said, no, get rid of the cages in a referendum, and then the government would have ignored it, because it's non-binding. Another example is in Austria. Um, where there were just some groups just really showed moral leadership. I believe it was one of the supermarket chains said, we're now going to have only cage-free eggs. And that, that convinced a lot of people, you know? So, so yeah, there are a number of ways, there are a number of approaches. Um, yeah, we can see you across the room. Any other questions? Uh, recently, I was in the media uh, that various U.S. states uh, made it an offence to uh, not declare that you're an animal activist while when applying for work in um, factory farming industries. And is there any chance of a similar thing happening here? And also, what sort of methods do um, the industry use at the moment here to hide what they do from the public. Yeah, well, and, and the, the ag gag bills um, that they use in the States as well, criminalising protests. Gee, thank goodness that doesn't happen here, right? Except how about the proposal to criminalise all protest at sea? To come within 500 metres of a ship, um, even if you're not in any way interfering with its operations. Or, so, yeah, this is something that um, governments of a certain political complexion do tend to do. Uh, and yeah, I think we're at serious risk of that kind of thing happening, absolutely. And I think we're seeing exactly that happening in a slightly different uh, forum right now. Uh, so yeah, well, in the States you get some quite, because of the degree of devolution that you have um, in, a, in a federal system, um, you have some quite extraordinary stuff 
that happens, you know. So you'll see there will be broad international trends, but some of the things that happen at the state level and the county level in law in America is really extreme, just because, yeah, the, the discourse has shifted so far to the right. Um, and, and it's just debate and scrutiny just isn't really as rigorous as it is in, in New Zealand's parliament. <laughs> That's saying something. So, <laughs> in short, yes, I think, I think there's a risk, definitely. I mean, you know, um, the, the discussion in Parliament, I mean, um, and I'm not just saying this because Mojo's left, in fact, I think she'd back me up more than anybody, um, when um, one of the most dispiriting things you could ever watch, one of the <laughs> things that may destroy your faith in the, in the democratic or certainly the parliamentary process is to actually go and watch a session of Parliament, go and watch Question Time and the sophomore childish level of debate. Now fortunately that's not actually where the real work is done. The real work is done off in select committee rooms where people tend to behave like adults and, and make sense. Um, but yeah, in short, yes, I think that is that is something that could happen here. It's definitely a risk. And the second part of the question is like how do industries try to hide you know, what, what's going on? Oh. Um, and yeah, they do. Because the fact is that factory farming especially uh, but also animals in, in the laboratories and like in, in the research facilities, everything takes place behind closed doors. And in the past, um, not so much because nobody was sort of campaigning against them, so they weren't so worried. You could just walk onto a farm and, and have a look around, sort of thing. But now you see all the fences up around the farms, you see the big signs up, and now it's all about biosecurity. So what they're trying to say now is if you go onto a farm, you're endangering the lives of the animals. <laughs> and this is why you have activists that have to grow, go on in the middle of the night, crawl around at risk of their own life, because, you know, the farmer could come out with a shotgun, and then take pictures of the animals suffering, and only then can we make a complaint to Matt, or NPI now, to say, hey, look what's going on here. And, 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 this, and isn't it ridiculous that animal rights people have to break the law to find out whether animals suffer on these farms or not? And invariably, when they go to these factory farms, they found all sorts of things wrong. The last example, a group of activists went onto a farm in Christchurch just over Easter weekend on a pig farm. And now you would think that the pig industry, after all their bad publicity, would sort of try to tidy up their act. And this was a farm that falls under the pig care system of the industry. So the industry goes in and they audit the farm and they say, yeah, that's good. So this farmer was all good and he had this pig care audit. They go onto this farm and what do they find? Pigs this deep in shit rotting pigs, mm -hmm. other pigs sitting on top of them, that's what they found on the farm. So I get the footage, I have to make a complaint to NPR, I say, why is this still happening? So they've been out to the farm, they have investigated the farming, yes, they find the rotting dead pigs and all the blah, blah, blah. So is the farmer being prosecuted? Oh, God, no, we're going to educate his workers. You know, so, so, and you couldn't go in because the farm, the big, big signs, no, no, no entry, blah, 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 and you'll be trespassing when you go on. So clearly it's not in the industry's interest for people to come on their farms and see what they're doing. And, and I would have thought that if you've got nothing to hide, if you're proud of what you're doing, you should go in. My very first visits to farms, I went in there and there were like with 30 little school kids all running around. Well, there was no biosecurity obviously then, because they were all running around touching everything. So I think that's just a bogus argument to keep activists out of farms. Just, um, I don't actually have a question. I just want to say I'm really glad I came. I'm absolutely horrified at what I heard tonight. But and I mean, we have. It's really. I think it's really difficult. I mean, I believe that every little action counts, you know, to save lives because it's so important. But I just see it. Uh, I see the problem also as a cultural problem because this civilization actually looks at. I mean, yeah, animals are tortured and. and brutalized a lot more than humans. Humans are safer, but everything is looked at as, you know, even humans are looked at as, you know, you have to be a good producing economical unit, you know, it's all about economic growth and everything, you, you know, it's even with the act, this whole economic and scientific approach, you know, other than they are living beings, you know, they are just like, they, they living beings, so, but it's not even, it's not even part of it. You know, it's just about how much, um, well, how useful they are in terms of producing, you know, growth and whatever financial growth. So I guess I'm just expressing um, 
it's a little bit, I just feel it's, um, it's a little bit of a hopeless matter. You know, I, I know that, yeah, saving lives, yes, but um, there's just so much brutality that goes on, so much. Murder. One of the big problems, one of the big problems is that, um, that we have this, this strict dualism in, that, that's, that's fundamental in, in you know, Western or global movement or Anglo-American culture, however you, you would frame it. A dualism being that, that, that there is human and non-human, you know, there's, there's, and humans are, well, we're very special, you know, we have all these rights and, and, and we're very important and, and we're at the center of our, you know, world view, unsurprisingly. Um, and then there's everything else, there's all non-human nature. And that's, and that's perhaps the, the, the fundamental sort of cultural or philosophical issue that you're talking about. Um, and since you bring it up, and I'm glad you do. There, there is some, there is some hope there. Well, there are other models um, that are being developed, and, and other legal and constitutional models that are being developed elsewhere in the world. Um, in the Constitution of Bolivia of 2009, it's the first constitution in the world. This is actually partly what I wrote my master's thesis on. Um, the in in Bolivia, they actually recognise for the first time in history in any legal system that I've ever been able to find, recognised. Uh, the legal personhood of non-human nature. That is, a thing that is not human being something other than property, or being in the commons and, and not belonging to anybody. Um, and that's revolutionary, and that's, that's law there in Bolivia. Um, and you think, oh, okay, well, up in the Andes, you know, who knows what's going on. But, <laughs> so there's that precedent. But this is an idea, this is a conception. And what does that mean in practical terms anyway? Well, what it means in practical terms is that if you, if you see something in, in New Zealand, for instance, if you have a concern with how an animal is treated, you have to fit that concern within the law. And, um, and in fact, it has to be um, actually within the, the anti-cruelty or the welfare legislation that we have. So it's very narrowed down what is appropriate and what is correct as the way to think of uh, you know, how the animal is treated. And, and to just say, oh, but it's not fair, it's not right, they think and they feel, this would be laughed out of a court of law or a university lecture theatre as being hopelessly naive. You just don't understand. It's unsophisticated. You don't get it. Um, but it's actually a, a really fundamental shift to actually um, see um, other things that aren't human as, as having some form of legal personhood. Because uh, corporations have legal personhood. A corporation has can sue and, and has, has many of the rights of a, of, a, of a natural person, an individual. A ship is a legal person. Uh, when you seize a ship at port for non-payment of excises or taxes or, or for owing money, you're said to arrest the ship. That's the technical legal term because it is a legal person. And yet, a whale or a, or a horse or a cow or a pig isn't. Uh, so, but when, that, when that's changed, once you unpick that, what that means is that um, any person, because this is the great problem in law, in environmental law and in animal law, is that you have to show standing. You have to show that, that you are directed, your personal, usually property rights, are somehow affected by a decision of a government or by an action of an individual or a corporation or whatever. You have to demonstrate that you have standing, that is, that you have the right to bring a proceeding. Um, in the courts, um, or to seek a, a review of an administrative action, that is something that a government does. You have to prove to the court that you actually are qualified, that you're allowed to raise that concern. It's not enough to say, I really care about the Maui's dolphin, and, and I want the government to stop doing what's it, what they're doing, so I'm going to ask for a review of this action, or that they do this, or whatever. Um, you can't do that unless you can show standing. So, so what it does, once you remove that, and this has been done somewhere in the world, um, then, then you actually, what it allows people in the Bolivian law to do is to actually, is that any person can bring an action on behalf of, can act as, a, as essentially as a legal guardian, just the way that the interests of a child will be advanced and protected by a lawyer or an individual who's, who's, who's appointed as their legal uh, representative, to actually argue on their behalf. You know? And this all sounds very Andean and, and esoteric and, oh, will it ever happen here? Well, just last year, and I, I wonder if, if the treaty negotiators really knew what they were letting in, but you, some of you may have heard the, um, the Whanganui River Iwi um, actually reached a, a treaty settlement that included the recognition of the Whanganui River 
as a legal person. It actually has legal personhood. And so is treated differently from every other body of water in New Zealand and is actually recognised as being a living, functioning ecosystem with its own, with its own rights and protections and integrity and its own ecological integrity that, that, that is to be protected and that any person can actually bring a claim. I think it may be restricted to the iwi, that the guardians of that river have been appointed, um, and that any person can actually represent this entity. Um, rather than, and it's in stark contrast to the approach I was reading, um, uh, that some very, very dull council documents up in Auckland um, the other night, and, and I came across the most horrific <laughs> term for the streams that run into the harbour and the harbour itself as a collective receiving environment. <laughs> so, you know, there are some, there are some, um, some diametrically opposed approaches. So, there is something we, you know, there is, there is some really coherent legal and political thinking around this. And this is something that the door has been slightly opened in New Zealand. This is something we can do. This is something that can happen. It's something to think about. So, yeah. Think about that. <laughs> hey, look, Tina, we're just about going to be out of time. Um, so if anyone's got any specific questions they'd like to ask Tina or Hans, um, grab a cupcake and a cup of tea, um, yeah. and you can have an informal we'll chat. Um, that's probably the best way. Don't mock them all at once. Um, but thank you very much, both of you, for um, presenting all of this for us. And if, if you want any more information or you're not already on the safe email list, put, please put your name and email um, down the back there or grab one of our um, magazines there and I thank you all for coming. Brilliant.